Okay, evening brothers and sisters. I'm going to try to pull together here some information on the scorpion. Um, how relevant it's going to prove to be. I don't know, but I was looking at it today, so I thought, hey, why not? We'll take a look at it. And, uh, well, in this passage in 1 Kings, I have it on the commentary here right now, uh, but we'll pull up the, the actual verse itself. Um, so this is what um, Rehoboam said, and he was the one that took over from his father, King Solomon. And we get the word scorpion in this passage that he speaks in. Um, so we'll begin in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 13. And the king answered the people harshly. He rejected the advice of the elders, verse 14, and spoke to them as the young men had advised. So his advisors were all young men, saying, whereas my father, now remember who his father was, King Solomon, made your yoke heavy, I will add to your yoke. Whereas my father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So we're going to look at scorpion. So the king did not listen to the people, and indeed this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word she had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah, or Ahijah, the Shulonite, Shilonite, Shilonite. So I didn't look into that because I was busy looking into the scorpion, but I do want to look at that a little bit more. And so when I get into the study of... Uh, is it 1 Kings 14 and 16, or is it 2 Kings 14 and 16? To do with Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which I still am wanting to make a video on them two particular chapters. And what the sins of Jeroboam really was, and how it really truly does connect back to King Solomon. So here we have Rehoboam, his son, King Solomon's son in view. And here he has been making this threat to the people saying, oh, you know, you thought my father uh, put a yoke on you. I'm really um, going to add a real heavy yoke to you because I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. And so, uh, what did my computer just do? Wow. I don't know what it just did there. Looks like it just scrolled to the bottom for no reason. Um... So what we're going to do is we're going to pull up the commentary here, all right? And before we read into it, we're just going to do um, some investigating uh, when we think of a scorpion, okay? Um, so Strong's Greek word for scorpion is 4651. Um, and it says it's probably from an obsolete scorpo perhaps strengthened from the base of scopos, and meaning to pierce. Okay, so a scorpion from its sting. Scorpion. So we know when we get stung by a scorpion, we've been poisoned. Isn't that what we understand about a scorpion? And here it's akin to meaning to pierce, all right, in the New Testament Greek, which is what his threat was to the people of the kingdom, that he, he was threatening. He was going to, he, he says, you thought my father was bad. I'm going to pierce you with scorpion. And that was um, this, this whip that had many pieces of, um, sharp pieces of metal attached to it, which we'll look at, at. But this becomes very interesting, this word scorpion in the New Testament, because of the passage that it actually leads us to, which is in Revelation 9.6. All right, so like I said, I'm not sure how relevant uh, this study is going to be because I've only been in it for a little while, so I don't really know. Um, so, Revelation 9, um, verse 6, this is what it says. 9, verse 6. It says, In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. Um, is that the right verse? It's the verse before that. We'll read in verse 5. The locusts were not given power to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. Poison. They were poisoned. 
But this is the verse I actually want to look the words up in because we're going to find some relevant meaning here, I think. Um, so in those days, men will seek death and will not find it, and they will long to die, but death will escape them. So they're being stung by scorpion. It says their torment was as the stinging of a scorpion. So we know what causes that pain of the stinging of the scorpion is poison, don't we? And we know that it means to pierce. That's the understanding we're getting from scorpion, is to pierce. So when we look up the words here in verse 6, <clears throat> um, what was the word I wanted to look up? It was death, I believe. 2288. All right? So it's um, physical or spiritual death, figuratively, separation from the life, the salvation of God forever by dying without first experiencing death to self to receive his gift of salvation? <laughs> no, you're receiving her gift of salvation. Um, but this is what caught me. Death here is danger of death, death, fatal, pestilence. So what I've come to understand, pestilence seems to be linking over and over again back to the idea of contamination. And we know pestilence is a contamination, don't we? In this case, it's akin to poisoning the word. That's what it's akin to. Because that is why they're praying for death, actually, um, and can't escape it, all right? Because they've made a covenant with death, right? And so in that is their torment, is their torture, all right? So we find pestilence in this word death in Revelation 9.6. All right, we'll keep going here to see what else we can discover. Um, the death of the body, the separation of the soul from the body by which the life on earth is ended. Death, stroke, the loss of that life which alone is worthy of the name. The miserable state of the wicked dead in hell. So, all the miseries arising from sin. So... It, it means they're poisoned, all right? It means they've been poisoned by a religious lie. And that poison is akin to the poison of a scorpion in this case. So if we go back, all right, on Revelation 9-6, and we look at the cross references, it gets to be quite interesting. Because this is what it says. And... This immediately, this passage also made my mind go back to Revelation 6.16, 6, where it says, And they say to the mountains and the rock, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So they're terrified to face the true living God, which the doctrine that they've been teaching in this world is akin to a poison and a pestilence that is killing and and bringing death upon us. But it says they're praying for it as well. Which takes you to the passage in Isaiah 28. Where they says, because they have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies, our refuge, our covering, our, our, our protection. We're protected by a covering of lies. And under falsehood, have we hid ourselves, a religious lie, an idol. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a, found it, a foundation stone. Remember, they wanted a harlot spirit as the foundation to build their house upon. Now, you know, if you're sitting inside of a house and it's falling apart, and all you think to yourself is, Well, you know what? I've got a good life. I shouldn't be complaining. And you don't go out and you don't discover that your house is falling down because you got a bad foundation. Guess what's going to happen? I think you're going to get exactly what you deserve. Nothing. You're going to have no covering whatsoever. None. And that's what your house, your protection is akin to. A habitation. A body. But if you can't be bothered to go in and look at the foundation which is causing the crumbling of our bodies, of our homes around us, our home earth, 
then you really don't deserve a covering. You don't deserve a body if you can't be bothered to go out and examine the foundation. You really can't. And that foundation that they laid in place was a harlot spirit that bowed to a religious idol called Baal, your husband as Lord and God. It is idolatry. So, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and them that believeth shall not make haste. Right? You're not going to fear. You're not going to fear so easily because you have the truth. And in Isaiah 25, God says this, um, And in this mountain... Okay, what's at the top of a mountain? The pinnacle. Um, so those he-goats that climb to the pinnacle of the mountain, we also get daemon, domen. Um, we get the satyr, the devil, is linked to this word. Um, if you go through the whole um, series of words there, passages and different things, that leads us to Baal, Satan, Beelzebub, devil, satyr, uh, domen, daemon. Uh, they're all going to take you back to the accuser in the garden who accused his spirit, who he was supposed to be in covenant with, which was the righteous spirit. And he changes that out for a false foundation of a harlot spirit that will build him up as God. And so he ends up exalting himself to the top of the pinnacle and saying that he is the one that protects. Well, here, um, God says, um, where is it? Maybe I got the wrong verse. And she will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. So that's the dark covering that's covering you. It's a religious lie in law. And, um, but they say, well, we're protected by that. And when the overflowing scourge comes in, you know, we're protected under that falsehood of, of lies, right, they think, because they've made a covenant with Sheol, right? And they are at agreement. So it takes us actually to that um, scorpion in Revelations. So here in Jeremiah 8.3, it says, And wherever I have banished them, this is one of the cross-references cross for Revelations 9.6, and it takes us to Jeremiah 8.3. And it says, wherever I have banished them, the remnant of this evil family will choose death over life, declares the Lord God of hosts. So it takes us to this idea where she promises her daughter, she says, for what else can I do for the dear daughter of my people but to try their ways upon the earth? And they are so embittered by the idea of receiving the law of God from the original wife of the original covenant, which was the righteous daughter Israel herself, with the law of heaven on her tongue. They are so embittered about it that they will choose death over life. That will be their choice. But not only that, this passage took me to Micah chapter 2, because it says the same thing there. It brings in these families. So Micah chapter 2, this was in our study concerning the key of David. Um, where is it? Uh, Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks. And you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. Right. So in that day, one will take up a taunt against you and lament mournfully. We are totally ruined. So she measures out the allotted land of my people. How she removes it from me, she allots our field to traitors. So it's, it's her allowing it to be so. But it is King Solomon that we realize that was actually guilty of doing this thing. Um, so we're bringing in Solomon, which is linking us back to Rehoboam in a minute. So therefore there will be no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by casting lots. So because of the rejection of her righteous daughter's 
the righteous spirit daughter Israel upon this earth, they were no longer allowed to cast a cord in the assembly. And what we're looking at here is the larger picture of the congregation that met on the north mountain or the Mount of the North in Isaiah 14. Um, and eventually that came to pass. And what that picture entails is a much larger picture than just earth is what it looks like. Uh, so they say, the false prophets say here, quit your preaching, they preach. <laughs> oh, don't that sound familiar like today? You women aren't supposed to preach. It's about us, Baal. Well, that was Baal prophesying through Baal. And we get that in Jeremiah 23. Baal is another name for your husband, Baal, which is Strong's Hebrew 1167. The god Baal is 1168, but it tells you it is the same as Baal, your husband, which then further tells you it is an idolatrous idol. You are not to be seen to be bowing to your husband as if he's the Lord and God. You were never supposed to do it. But the false prophets began to prophesy that Baal was Lord and God, right? And in Lamentations chapter 2, it says, verse 14, it says, They have not discovered what brought the daughters into captivity, into bondage. And, and so we have them here teaching, quit your preaching, they preach. They should not preach these things. Shame will not overtake us. So house of Jacob, should it be asked, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Actually, it says, O thou that art named the house of Jacob. No, he stole her birthright. The house was always supposed to be Israel, which was identified as that angel, the presence of God, that he actually wrestled with. So we get the term God wrestles is what Israel means. And she indeed wrestled with Jacob when Jacob was at that point determining that he was going to steal her birthright. And you see her actually hamstringing him. And you would only see this in a case where God was looking to take out an army, an opposing army. So why would she hamstring Jacob except to send a strong message, I'm coming after you again. And we know it was the camp of God, Mahanaim. It was the daughter of Israel herself that he wrestled with to remove her birthright from her and claimed it. And he says, what's your name? In the passage that he actually wrestles with, I believe that's Genesis 37. And she says, why are you asking my name? You've already gotten my birthright because you know my name. You know my name is daughter Israel and I'm going to give you my birthright. But you understand by me hamstringing you, I'm leaving a strong message, right? So she says, O oh, thou that art named the house of Israel, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these her doings? Do not my words do good to her that walketh upright? And yet they're, they're teaching, quit your preaching. They preach. They should not preach these things. Shame will not overtake us, you see? So they were preaching about Baal, and they were really um, not discovering what had brought the daughters into bondage, or at least not telling them, and thinking that they were never going to forget and fall into the same bondage, which is exactly what they've done. And it says, she'll escape, but he won't. So she's speaking of her remnant daughters, which we get an understanding of in Romans chapter 11. What has Israel not obtained that which it says he seeketh? She seeketh for her children. Yet more are the children of the desolate spirit than of she who has a husband. And what does she, the harlot, say there? Baal is the word gave for her because she's married to Baal, teaching his religious lie of Baal as God. And yet more are the children of the desolate, the outcast that no man sought a covenant with, which was the presence of God on this earth that Jacob actually fought, wrestled with. So it says there'll be enmity between the woman's seed and actually the harlot seed that bows to Satan, Adam, as if he's God, Lord and God, bridegroom, right? Yeah. And uh, that's the religious lie in the earth. And um, so we go to the scorpion here. I'm going to have to go because I'm forgetting so many of my thoughts here. But Micah 2 was a clear presence. Um, of 
the key of David and what they were doing to her. All right. So, but recently my people have risen up like an enemy. She's saying, my sons have risen up like an enemy. And you strip off my daughter's robe and glory from those who are passing through confidently like you are men at war. So we get the understanding that their tongue, uh, oh, it was like butter in their mouth, it says, right? But it's, and, and it says, but war was in their hearts. And that's just what we see here. Um, they're working to take the spirit of the righteous daughter, Israel's covenant, out of the land. We see Jacob wrestling it from her and taking it from her. And we know that this is the camp of Mahanaim, that he names the camp of God, the presence of God on this earth. The men were at war with the daughters. They did not want to receive the law of heaven at their mouth. So they said, well, we'll write our own law. And we see Adam actually bringing her down as a harlot under him and his law is what we actually see. And the telling of the tale by the hand of Baal. Um, so we see them ripping the glory off of these daughters. The women of my people you evict. Each one from her pleasant house, from her children, you have taken away my glory forever, she says, mine. So in Romans 11, they'll say, he has not obtained what he seeketh for. She, Israel, which is the birthright holder. Um, what, has Israel not obtained that which she seeketh for? She seeks for her children. Yet more are the children of the desolate spirit than of she who has been. Husband. She who has a husband, she says, ha! I will never be widowless. I will never be childless. I am hid in his heart. She's saying when she says, no one sees me. No. No. Yeah. Because Adam told a big fit, fat lie. Accused the righteous spirit Israel upon the earth. And then Jacob wrestles with her to take her birthright from her. To which she's seen handing it over. And the interesting thing is, she says, let me go, I must go. Because the night is over, right? And she is in the night, she's vanquished to the night. And he's the one now walking in this light, but it's a false light. That's what we come to understand through the Shulamite saying, look not upon me, because the mother, my mother's sons were angry with me. <clears throat> They made me the keeper of the vineyard, but my own vineyard I have not kept. But the false light turns her black, all right? And she is seen as the head of the camp of Mahanaim. She has a double camp. And that is the presence of God denied on this earth, her rightful covenant. And then you see these signs who are at agreement with Sheol saying, Don't worry, the law is going to protect us. Don't worry. The lie that Baal, bridegroom, Jesus, the image of Baal standing, which each consecutive kingdom built upon from Daniel 2, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he saw this idol standing of a man. And then you see the stone cut out without hands. That's a representation of these daughters of Israel reborn in the land as the presence of God. They never did leave. And they smashes the toes on that false image and brings it down. So, we are looking at a poisoning of our doctrine here. And what does she say? We look at piercing from the scorpion perspective. She says to Israel, Isaiah 41, 15, See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. There we get the piercing. You will thresh the mountains and crush them. And reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them. And a wind will carry them away. A gale will scatter them. But you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. That's a woman. That's a queen. That ain't a king. That's the lie they tell you. To keep you yoked under the bondage of a religious lie and law. And she says, but they have not discovered what brought you into captivity. They have told you a lie. They say, peace, peace, when there was no peace. 
You have not healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, and that is the only way to heal the house. Right? You tore her down. So what does the commentary say on 1 Kings 12, verse 14? I found this quite fascinating. Because it is a direct at women, it is so, when you get your understanding. But real Boam, this is the Ki'il, um, biblical commentary on the Old Testament. I'll put this link below. But Rehoboam forsook this advice. And he asked the younger ministers who had grown up with him. And they advised him to overawe the people by harsh treatment. So this is what he says. This is how we understand it is actually linking to the righteous daughters of Israel. Because he's actually making a threat to them. And he says, my little finger is stronger than my father's loins. So, what was King Solomon guilty of? Well, I guess he had pretty powerful loins to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. Yeah, but what I've come to understand is the concubines he made from the righteous daughters of Israel. And he took the surrounding Adamic nations known as the harlot spirit that bowed to Baal, as his wives. That's what he did. And eventually what happens to these daughters of Israel, other than being murdered and um, all kinds of nasties that got done to them were told in the Bible, um, we see them getting tossed out into the lands of the Gentiles. This is what we actually see. But this is a threat from Rehoboam. It was passed on for, from a forefather. Yeah. Um, so my little finger is stronger than my father's loins. The little finger for the form, okay, a figurative expression in the sense of, I possess much greater might than my father. So it's a threat to the daughters. I'm really, you thought my father suppressed you by daubing up the gate so that the key of David, the righteous daughters, couldn't flow through as the living water, right? the uncontaminated water that would give you eternal life. He didn't want it. So what actually comes into play is the poison of the um, wormwood. It's cobra's venom in the stomach, which is linking us back to the scorpion sting, the pierce. But over time, these daughters themselves, actually, because of what was done to them, and they were rejected, they are, it is akin to being pierced. They were pierced through. Um, and and um, the breach was great that took place. Um, and mother says, how can I heal the hurt of the daughter of my people? The breach is great. It's great. The men want the harlot. But what they don't realize is with a false foundation, over time, your house will utterly collapse. And you will be without a covering. You will be without a body. You will be a formless spirit. That's right. That's what it looks like. And from my understanding, from what little research I've done on that, um, you know, from people who claims to have experienced this body, this formlessness, and just a spirit, um, they're blind. Um, they can hear very little. Um, and it's a very frightening, um, uh, I don't know, situation, uh, from what I understand to be in. Um, it's devastating to be without a form, to be without a covering. And so if you lay a false foundation <clears throat> and your house starts to crumble, you normally go out and check that foundation and try to repair what damage was done. And in most cases, it seems to me you'd want to put back better <clears throat> than what was there, or you'd want to put back the original, right? So we know that they traded out the true foundation for a lie, and then built a house of lies upon it. And that house of lies is not going to stand, and it's not going to cover you. And they are so full of pride that they're even going to pray for death. Um, and so... Here we really have this. He says, my father laid a heavy yoke upon you, and I will still further add to your yoke. 
I will lay still more upon you. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. So scorpions, it's got scorpions, are whips with barbed points like the point of a scorpion's sting. So we get the further poisoning idea here. He's further poisoning them. And he's actually using violence to bring about more poisoning of the spirit. So we know that what we live in now is considered the anti-Christ spirit. She was the Messiah on this earth, if you want to use that word, Messiah. And they rejected her as the cornerstone where life is found. They did not want her. And what they do is they lay a harlot spirit that in the end causes their house to crumble. Because we get that understanding in the words in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 6. Why now do I see every man standing around with his hands on his hips as a woman in travail and every face turned pale? Every face turned pale in the commentary means that they're bearing witness to the entire system falling and collapsing. And that's their house collapsing in death, right? Never to rise again because of the false foundation that they put in place because it tickled their ears. It was like honey on their tongue, but it was wormwood in their stomach. Iniquity is shaped by the law. It will never lead to eternal life. But what more here got me thinking, why now do I see every man standing around with his hands on his hips as a woman in travail and every face turned pale? I thought of when the presence of God hamstrung Jacob. And it looks like she makes good on that threat in some way that I don't fully comprehend. Um, but it comes back to hunt them, all right, and all their religious lies. So, what do we want to look at here? So Romans 11, God says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? These were the daughters of Israel. God forbid, but rather through their fall. So it was permitted for this reason. Salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Provoke who? The sons of Israel who rejected the daughters of Israel and did not want them in covenant. So it's really to provoke the sons of Israel to jealousy for rejecting the scepter that they were supposed to rule through and where real power and real eternal life is found, not the made-up religious lie of a man, Baal, standing as your Lord and master, which is idolatry, which will put you under bondage, which means the men of Baal taught about themselves because it tickled their ears and was like honey on their tongue. And the harlot says, no one sees me. Yep. And so, all right. What else was there? So we went through Micah. Um, Isaiah 28, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So, again, when we look scorpions up in the New Testament with death, uh, it actually leads us to um, pestilence. And there was some discussion on one of my videos that the Jews claim that they mistranslated Revelation in some instances. Of course, they did this and they said they threw in the Lamb or Christ um, where it never appeared. Um, that was a new addition by um, the Christian religion. <coughs> but from what I understand, the white horse, they say, was actually called pestilence. And that fits with the Latin meaning of corona. I believe it's the Latin meaning. Because what did we have on the loose? A pestilence, didn't we? But corona also means crown, right? So the poison is, um, you know, you can either receive her truth and be delivered by it, 
Or you can be poisoned by the lie, and you can hope for death. And um, that that takes us to Revelation 9. Um, right? She says, I'm going to remove, I'm going to expose your life. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off of, from the vine, and as a, um, what does it say, falling fig from the fig tree. Now most people get confused by that because Israel is allegorical to the fig tree. And this is absolutely right. Because the sons of Israel chose a covenant with the harlot spirit Babylon, who's hidden his heart. And the true scepter, the true rulers, the daughters of Israel, who are called God on this earth. And Israel is known as God wrestles. And she's wrestling the harlot that comes to be exalted in man's heart. That's what she's wrestling. And the harlot says in Ezekiel, is it Ezekiel? It's Isaiah 47. She says, I will never be widowless. I will never be childless. I'm hid in his heart. No one sees me. Oh, but that leads to the eventual collapse of your house, of your covering. It can't save you. You will be formless. You will be bodiless. And from what I can understand, what little bit I can understand, it's the most horrible thing um, that a, a spirit that lives eternally can experience is to have no covering, no habitation. And when you've got a false foundation laid as a harlot spirit, expect your house to fall. Because there is no healing for the daughters under a religious lie in law who are the ones who can save you. Know thee not, thine own right hand can save thee. And uh, we get three, four, four, four. The victors, Yeshua feminine. It is through them that you are made victorious and that you are made to live. But she also says, don't worry, you'll be no burden to me. I won't deliver you because you are no children of mine. And um, so here we see the fig tree. We know that Israel, the sons of Israel, who cast off a covenant with the righteous daughters of Israel in the wanderings and took unto them Selves the harlot spirit, <clears throat> and then from there wrote their own laws and fed them out to the four corners of the globe, is what they did. And um, and yet she will come out of the dust of the earth. She comes out amongst the Gentiles, and um, because she's out amongst the Gentiles, because these daughters, a remnant few daughters that are left in the land are still out amongst the Gentiles. Uh, technically, the Gentiles become part of her birthright. And because she is Israel herself, Israel is saved as well. And you get all of that understanding in Isaiah 49, for anybody who can understand that it is not a son, it is a daughter of her womb, who is the firstborn. And she says, oh, they may have forgotten about you, my dear daughter. Oh, they might ignore you even exist. But she says, I'm the one that birthed you. I'm the one that gave life to you. And so it's this daughter on earth that is considered the firstborn of her womb. And she says, yet will my children live again with my dead body. And so that's her reborn out of the dust of the earth. And... What it looks like on a larger scale, um, in some ways, Earth looks like it will be reborn again out of Mother's womb. And because of that, she's considered the firstborn. She is, right? And that's all made the promise in uh, Isaiah 49. She will claim them all. She says, the Gentiles will be yours. Um, and, and she says, what, has Israel not obtained that which she seeketh for? She says, of course they've obtained that which she sought for. This was the purpose of the whole thing. Um, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, 
salvation has come unto the Gentiles. For to provoke who to jealousy? It's actually to provoke the sons of Israel to jealousy because they did not want her in covenant. And so when she becomes reborn out of the dust of the earth, teaching the truth of heaven, um, the Gentiles is actually her possessions and the sons out there um, because she's out there. They're her sons, they're her children. And it's to provoke the sons of Israel who chose a covenant um, with the women from the surrounding Adamic nations that surrounded the daughters of Israel like thorns and thistles. They kept coming at them to pierce them. Um, and so she's promised yet more are the children of the desolate one whom no man sought a covenant with and chose to try to take that foundation out. Now we, we discussed how it got covered over. Um, she says, your pathways were not seen. My pathways were not seen. Um, when the Red Sea, that's your admixture of doctrine. Um, we also was looking at Isaiah 29 briefly. Here tonight I was. Uh, let me see if I can find it. And um, this is what it says of the wine on the table. This is why you're going to drink uh, blood. And this is why you're going to wash in it in Revelation. Because that's what you want it. Um, and this is what she says to the priests. Let me see. This is what she says. Okay, that's where they were reading it. And they can't understand it because... They can't be bothered to listen to wisdom. Um, and then here we have them. Where is it? Okay, so maybe it was 28. Let me go back up here and see. Yeah, that's empty. Multitude of the nations, earthquake, tempest. Um, oh, it must have been chapter 28 that I was reading, so sorry about that. I thought it was 29. I get these chapters mixed up because I'm over them so much, then they just get to kind of blur together. Um... Verse 7, all right, you know, there's such a confusion of the Old Testament passages that most people refuse um, to see the truth in them and what they're actually telling you. Um, so the wine on the table, she says, I've been forced to mingle my wine. Wisdom says that in Proverbs chapter 9. Um, and she says, I've been forced to mingle my doctrine. So she's saying my truth is in there with the lies. And she calls that admixture a wine. But it's allegorical to the Red Sea that must be parted before the children can be birthed out. And she says, again, the daughters of Israel says this again in Isaiah 26, I think. She says, we have been with child. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. The word for wind there is spirit. But you're going to get your allegorical understanding in your Greek word 417, which means empty doctrine. And she says, we have, as it were, we brought forth empty doctrines. Nothing that could really deliver our children. Because the men told us a lie. They taught us a religious lie. And they used the violence of the scourging, of the whips, of the scorpion, to continue to poison the doctrine through violence. All right? They forced it down our throat. And, um, and they, that's why this is called a beast system. That's why it's an antichrist. It went against her spirit. That's right. It went against her, is what it did. And it becomes founded on a system of lies which brings violence against her. And that's why Rehoboam makes that threat in there about his father's loins. He's actually directing the threat at the daughters of Israel and saying, You think you're a yoke now? You just wait till I'm through. You're going to be so poisoned by the religious lie, you're not even going to know who you are. And wow, that sort of came to pass for quite a long time. Yet more are the children of the desolate than of she 
who has a husband. She bows to the image of Baal, an idol. And it says, oh, but they will learn the truth. Yeah, they'll grumble, they'll groan. But they're going to come to the sense and reason of it after a while. Actually, after I send my um, all of this stuff to come to pass, which was the poisoning of the water with blood that you're drinking, uh, which is the poison and, and washing in it. And then it says the dragon in Daniel speaks like a lamb. It has two horns like a lamb. But it's really people who's drunk on the religious lie in wine and has that poison and wormwood in them. That's really saying Jesus said this. And they're giving life to the image to speak and to, but it's really a dragon at the heart of man. War is in his heart. So, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. This is Isaiah 28, verse 7. The priests and the prophets have erred through strong drink. We're shown him, man, Solomon, whoever. All of them's part and parcel of the same package. Putting that, that drink to his neighbor's lips, which is Israel. Because you've got Judah and you've got Israel. He was using violence to embed it into her. So he was putting this drink to her lips. And he was making her drunk on it. You know why? So that he could expose her nakedness. All oh, the spice of life. Oh, isn't it variety? You can sell and trade as many of them as you like. You can have 700 wives. Oh, isn't that the spice of life? The spice, they're referred to as spices, these daughters. And Song of Songs. Yeah. And so you get the, the sick undertones of what they called the spice of life. It was really sick. Um, so, but here we have them aired through strong drink. We see him doing that in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, I believe, verses 15 and 16. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Habakkuk. And we're seeing him exposing her nakedness. That's what he does. Let's read it. I'm just about done here. Um, Habakkuk. Let's go to Habakkuk. How long will it take me to find it? Okay, so Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2, verses 15 and 16. And watch out for your he pronoun. They stuck it everywhere where it don't make an ounce of sense. So woe unto him that giveth his neighbor, his sister, drink. That put his thought bottle to, it's got him italicized, yeah, to her. And makest her drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. What does it say in Micah chapter 4? Let her eyes look upon Zion, let her be defiled. So by putting this poison to her lips, this admixture... They made her to bow to Baal, husband and lord, who is considered an idolatrous idol, and they have not discovered the sins of the daughters of Israel. That's what it says. Because you know why? Baal was prophesying through the imaginations of his wicked heart. He wanted her to bow as his harlot so he could expose her nakedness. Ha ha. That's what he wanted. So thou, um, woe well unto him that giveth his neighbor sister drink that putteth his bottle to her and maketh her drunken so that he may look at her nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. So here we have really an allegory to the scorpion. All right. And let your foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand, right? Know they not thine own right hand can save thee. 
um, shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on your glory. What's your glory? The harlot spirit, which really, in effect, is Baal inside of Baal, the abomination of desolation, shall be a desolate spirit. You see? Him inside of himself. He's saying he's the spirit. Man, Baal, Jesus, bridegroom, idolatry. That's what that is, to bow to your husband as Lord and God. And that's what's going on in the earth. And you are bowing to a religious lie and lie. And he has written horrible lies that's yoked around your neck. More so, way more so than his. Um, so here we have, but they also have erred through wine, through strong drink, are out of the way. The priests and the prophets have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. There we have the wine on the table. Wash in blood. Yeah, that'll save you. No, it won't. It will not save you. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment. So we have how many people prophesying through Jesus. They are giving power to the idol. That's what they're doing. They're causing it to live and to breathe. That image that you find in Daniel 2 that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of standing being smashed on the toes. So for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. It's a dirty place. Whom shall he? No, she teach knowledge. He has no. So we got wisdom actually speaking here in verse 9. And she's saying, so to whom will I teach knowledge to? And whom shall I make to understand my doctrine? The truth. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So we're getting an identification of the feminine here. It's actually she's speaking about her own children. That's what you're looking at. But she's saying it must be precept upon precept upon precept upon precept. Line upon line upon line. Here a little. There a little. So we have the arrangement of the Proverbs by the Koalith. Actually looking there. In Ecclesiastics, I said, made the mistake of saying Daniel 12. It's Ecclesiastics chapter 12. And uh, so, for with stammering lips and another tongue will she speak to this people. So, another language, right? Uh, a foreign tongue, yeah. Uh, that may be the language of allegory as well that we're looking at there. Um, right. So here we're getting the healing of the daughters actually in view in verse 12. To whom, she said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, the renewing. Yet they would not hear. Yeah, that's why the rod of iron gets pulled up. And that rod of iron is akin to the firstborn daughter who was rejected in the earth. And mother says there, to the firstborn of her womb, who is no son, it is the daughter. She says, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me the nations, and I'll give them all to you. You may judge them in whatever capacity that you see fit, for they have rejected you. And um, so there we go. That's all I'm going to say. Um, here's got, it translates as law in verse 13. This is the place of rest. Let the weary rest. This is the place of repose. But they wouldn't listen. They won't listen, right? They'll seek death before they ever seek the truth. Yeah. And that's why it says, oh, this overflowing scorch of religious lies is going to save us and cover us. No, it's not. It's going to leave to you with absolutely no habitation. You will have no protection. Then the word of the Lord came to them. Law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line, here a little, there a little, so they go stumbling backwards. All right, so that is how it became contaminated. She allowed them to have their law, right? But she says, to whom will I teach the truth to? All right? So we see a double effect going on here, how the stumbling happens and how the, then the standing up and picking up the head comes back in when she begins to uh, hear a familiar voice as of one who speaketh the covenant of God out of the dust of the earth, which is 
in the beginning her Ten Commandments, their laws of peace. But because they won't receive that, they won't listen to wisdom and to her daughter reborn upon this earth, then she's forced to send a rod of iron, which is akin to the cutting away and harsh treatment as well in the judgment. So we saw, fine, you want the law? You want a little bit here, a little bit there? And over time we saw the stumbling backwards. And then we see her actually picking herself up and once again standing for the truth in the earth is what we see. And um, so they mock. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule my people, which is in Jerusalem, Israel, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. So whenever the overflowing scourge um, what was that? Pestilence shall come through. It won't touch us, right? For we have made a refuge. Lies. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And uh, that's the covering that won't protect you. Lies will never save anyone. That's the false foundation laid. And then God says, Lord God, here is daughter Israel herself speaking. Therefore the Lord God said, look, I have laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. Those are all female. A sure foundation, the one who believes, will be unshakable. Yeah. So uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Now I can't remember what it was. But it says, your covenant with death will be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. So they think they're going to be preserved under a lie. The fig tree uh, is actually going to lose its fruits. That fig tree is allegorical to Israel. But understand, the sons of Israel married the harlot spirit uh, that would come under him and teach his religious lies and laws that he wrote himself. Uh, which is really what the world system is founded upon. This pile of S-H-I-T, which is another name for Baal. He's called Lord of Dung. Perhaps I should say Dung. This pile of lies and dung. And the house will never stand and cover you that they built. Nope. And, uh, and yet you can tell them this. Wisdom says, ah, they don't want me. That's fine. I'm going to mock you in the day of your calamity. Because when I tried to reason with you, you didn't want to hear it. And so now you're going to force me to send a rod of iron. Yeah. Uh, which is more severe and harsh treatment, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, uh, you can sit in a house and say, hey, this is good enough for me. But if your foundation is crumbling, guess what? You're going to get just what you deserve. No house. No habitation. You can't be bothered with the truth. So, And that's all addressed for anybody who can reason the truth out instead of listen to the men on the pulpit who wants to preach all about self, right? Their forefathers wanted to preach Baal, the wicked imaginations of their heart. Man is God, God, God. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's the video. Not quite an hour. Um, I pray the Lord blesses you with an abundance of the truth. I know I feel I have been truly blessed with the truth. Um, and again, I, I don't say I got 100%. I'm still learning as I go. Um, still looking at the covenant. I'm starting to comprehend a little bit more. Um, and uh, I'll, when I get a chance, I write a few details here and there. So I thank you for watching. I pray the Lord blesses you. And I hope you all have a really nice evening.